From the high desert of northern New Mexico, this is Circle for Original Thinking. I am your host, Galena Aparicio Perry. Welcome to Circle for Original Thinking, America's electronic talking circle for visionary thinkers. An open forum for fresh ideas and timeless wisdom applied to today's political and ecological challenges. Each week we bring together creative thinkers from a variety of different traditions. We ask the hard questions on the important issues of the day. Political polarization, climate change, virulent viruses, and other symptoms of humanity being out of balance with the natural world. Our goal is to recreate a whole and sacred America, a new and improved version of E Pluribus Unum, from the many to the one, and this time not leave anybody out. Join us as we embark on this quest. We have some great guests coming up on the Circle for Original Thinking podcast, beginning with New York Times bestselling author and co-founder of the Pachamama Alliance, John Perkins. John will be joined by my long-term friend, Bill Pfeiffer, the leader of Wild Earth Intensives and the author of Wild Earth, Wild Soul. On the following program, we're going to feature Jim Garrison, the founder of Ubiquity University and the host of the podcast, Humanity Rising, together with Will Tegel, eco-psychologist and the dean at Ubiquity University. Then after that, two directors from the creative arts, Rulan Tangan, the director of Dancing Earth, a wonderful Native American dance troupe, and Nancy Rhodes, the director of Encompass Opera. Another wonderful organization, both of whom are engaged in projects that bring together dance, music, and and raise ecological consciousness. So we have some exciting guests coming up. Now this week, I want to share directly with my listeners some of my own thoughts about current events and, and put them in a larger historical context. Because I I think the long view is often the more optimistic one, simply because it extricates one from, you know, what's happening at the present time that we tend to get so wrapped up into and think that we can't possibly solve. You know, short-term problems always appear more intractable and unsolvable. But then we, if we step back and realize that we've faced similar situations before and survived or even thrived, then we can recover our optimism, which is important. And I also, you know, I want to address this because it's one of the questions I'm most frequently asked is, you know, how, how do you stay optimistic during these troubled times, such as the January 6th insurrection and the, the failure of the Republican Party to hold Donald Trump to account for in the second impeachment trial or... Or even now, you know, the lack of bipartisanship on virtually anything and everything and the lack of relationship to truth, the fake election audits that are uh, occurring now, um, sometimes called fraudits, or voter suppression that seems to be almost an attack on democracy itself. Or some people are a little concerned about uncertainty in the U.S. economy and begin, you know, in, in the midst of the beginnings of what is clearly a, a recovery. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a desire by some for things to return to normal. But, you know, I would say that we, we really have to learn from the pandemic and not just simply return to normal, but um, learn something new. And it's also, I mean, quite frankly, I I just won a Nautilus Award for my book, Original Politics, in the category of World Cultures, Transformational Growth and Development. And that prompted me to wonder, is the world transforming in a positive way? So the questions... uh, the questions uh, are very related. You know, how do I stay optimistic during troubled times and is the world transforming in a positive way? So that's what I want to take a little peek at today. Um, and to me, the only way to do that is to really begin with blessing, to begin with prayer, 
This is something I learned from native elders like Toba Sanaquit Canoe, who, when he got up in the morning, before he ever got out of bed, before he ever put his feet on the floor, would be thankful for the gift of life and another day. And that's something I pray about every day. Every day, it's, an, it's a miracle to be alive. I mean, we could not be alive without the, without the, the breath of life in the form of oxygen that the trees and the phytoplankton give out, that we return to them in a sacred circle. Our form is carbon dioxide, but that's what they need to live. And so uh, the trees and the phytoplankton combining with the sun that gives us light, light, warmth, energy, creating photosynthesis and, and, and creating creating life and, and, and continuing life. This is, this is a miracle, and we are directly interconnected with this miracle. We are light. We are air. We are water. We are earth. We are all the elements. And uh, that's why some of the native elders I know the best think of the, the elements as the creators. I mean, it's not like the elements are just some kind of scientific thing. The elements are something worthy of praying to. And it's just such an overwhelmingly beautiful feeling to, 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 to realize and to contemplate how we are interconnected with all the elements and to look at nature in a way that, that uh, I love to do is to, you know, I think of the elements was loving each other really you know or let's look at water you know the 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 waters in the clouds and the waters under the ground they have a a loving relationship with each other it's the it's almost as if the the groundwater is calling calling writing writing letters to to the to uh romantic love letters to the clouds of the sky calling for them to come visit and 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 uh and then when the rain comes down it's like it's like the groundwater is receiving the the kisses of a lover that they've missed. You know, it's 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 a beautiful thing, and there is a relationship. This is one of the things I learned from Hopi elders, Vernon Masayesva, Jerry Anoa. Jerry's now in the spirit world now, uh, but they had a water conference and uh, on Hopi land, and they even brought uh, Masaru Emoto from Japan for that conference, and many other indigenous elders and they spoke about this in a way that really reached me deep in the heart because all those elements the, the water especially is 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 in relationship with us this is something Verna Masayesva tried to explain to the Peabody Coal Company that was producing coal slurry by and and telling the Hopi that oh we're just going to take a little little bit out of your groundwater but the Hopi knew that the groundwater was related to all the other waters, and, and when they took that little bit out, they upset the balance. And in upsetting the balance, uh, eventually those sacred springs that the Hopi were living um, with and, and, uh, and depending upon for millennia, they started to dry up. But the, the beautiful part of the story is that uh, the Black Mesa Trust Company that Verna Masayefso was the head of eventually actually got the Peabody Coal Company to move out, and things are rebalancing. So this sacred belief in, in uh, the way that the elements are interconnected is a very important, beautiful thing. And it sustains not just indigenous people, it sustains us all. We all are interconnected in that way to the elements. If you're a human being, you are light, you are air, you are water, you are earth. So when people talk about climate change and they talk about whether humans are causing climate change, my answer is that we are the climate. <laughs> So, of course, we're causing change. We're, we're, we're interconnected in an inextricable way that you can't get out of. Um, so that is part of uh, what I wanted to talk about today. Um, and it's, 
it's it's something deeply deeply important it's we are the light we are the air we are the water we're also the earth and that's really important too when you just take a handful of living soil fertile soil you're picking up billions and billions of microorganisms bacteria viruses worms ne- nematode worms and the like in one handful and that that must be remembered and particularly remembered during these covid times because in covid times we 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 were so we became i say we but uh, general mainstream society became very fearful of the virus the the novel coronavirus um but the truth is that as i we discussed on a podcast just uh um, a week or two ago with Jeremy Johnson and Barbara Carlson, 90% of our cells in our body are microbial, as much as 95% of our DNA. So bacteria, viruses, these microorganisms, these microbiome, they are pushing evolution. They are creating evolution. It's probably not a coincidence that after the last pandemic in the, in the 20th century that there was a big shift in the way that humanity uh, operated. And I expect something similar to happen again. And this time, I hope and pray that it is a shift that, that readily acknowledges and incorporates the living perennial wisdom that indigenous peoples and all of our forefathers understood was necessary for living in a harmonious way with life. Because when I do think about that second question, is the world transforming in a positive way? I have to say that, you know, as far as human culture is concerned, it's, it's an open question. Are we going down the right path? Or have we become a destructive force that, you know, a, a captive of our own mindset, this kind of particular form of greed or it's been called wetigo, the, the virus that imagines we're separate, superior and transcended from nature. That's a different kind of virus. Probably the most, the most powerful negative force that we can ever do is to imagine that we are separate and transcendent from the natural world. And when we do that, then the natural world becomes simply something we utilize for our own needs alone. And and that's when we start to call the the beautiful light air water earth the and and the related related resources of that we call them resources because they're 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 not something we have a sacred relationship with anymore it's something we're using to develop and that very fact of looking at a forest and instead of bathing in the beauty of the forest thinking of how we can turn this into an economic product that's the only thing GDP looks at. And that's a scary concept because two-thirds of the world we call, quote-unquote, undeveloped. If that other two-thirds of the world were to actually be actively mining the, mining the earth, w- raping and pillaging the earth, we'd be in big, big trouble. Now... I want to talk about this in the context of the place known as America or the United States, the place formerly known as Turtle Island. Um, And this was, of course, the subject of my book, Original Politics. Now, I contend in Original Politics that the highest ideals of America, liberty, justice, natural rights, were, were appropriated, borrowed from Native America by our founding fathers, Things like the the very idea to unite the colonies, which came from Chief Conestego, the Onondaga chief that uh, that spoke to Ben Franklin, and Ben Franklin, because 
he was a, a printer, recorded those important words that urged the colonies to unite, to be like we are, to never fall out with one another, to become a strong alliance. And Chief Conestego said that to Ben Franklin and the other colonists, and, and Chief Conestego handed Ben Franklin a single arrow. And before Ben Franklin could even examine the arrow, he took it back from him, and Chief Conestego then broke the arrow over his knee. Then Chief Conestego reached behind him to get a sheaf of arrows. I don't know if it was 13 arrows, but it was a sheaf of arrows. And he went to break that over his knee, but it did not break. And the meaning was plain to all. Ben Franklin later when we're making the, the great seal of the United States, remembers this and incorporates it into the great seal well, in the left talon of the eagle. The eagle is holding the 13 arrows, clearly indicating that there is strength in numbers, strength in being united. So the chief Conestego and the Onondaga chief, the Onondaga chief, was the force for getting the colonies to unite at all before they were 13 disparate uh, governments. And it was probably a pain for the, uh, for the Iroquois Confederacy to work with them in that way. So they got them to unite. Then they influenced the very founding document, the Articles of Confederation, which was based very strongly upon the Iroquois system, having a grand council, and there were original presidents in the first years. This is a little known fact, but before George Washington, there were presidents under the Articles of Confederation. But those presidents only served one year terms and they had no real substantial power. They were similar to a vice president presiding over the Senate. The president was presiding over the legislature. Um, but there were uh, about eight presidents before George Washington, uh, people like John Hancock, who served twice in that capacity. They, those presidents are rightly separated from George Washington on, because when we came to uh, the Constitutional Convention, we redesigned the office of the presidency enormously and gave the president far more power, and perhaps too much power. That's something to look at. We have to look at more closely today. In fact, since the Constitution, we've given the presidents even more power. The Congress has just given away some of the powers that were supposed to be held by the Congress, like the power to declare war that Congress has not done since 1942. So, uh, the, but with the Constitution, there were other things that were incorporated from from Native America, including checks and balances. There was a very similar system in Native America. But the real point that I want to make here is that Native America influenced the founding of the nation, but the founding fathers only appropriated the concepts to the extent that they understood them or that they wanted to implement and the, f and the first thing that they left out was women who held an integral role in Native American. And they also obviously left out people of color. So in leaving these things out, in leaving out women and people of color, they created an American shadow. So on one hand, we had these beautiful high ideals, all men are created equal. We find these truths to be self-evident, all men are created equal. The concepts of liberty, equality, a government by the people, for the people. The preamble of the Constitution even beginning with we the people, when in fact it was not the people that designed the Constitution, in fact, the the founding fathers designed it in secret, and uh, did uh, and uh, it was a small group of mostly aristocratic white male property owners, many of them attorneys. There were uh, Alexander Hamilton was not from the aristocracy, nor was Ben Franklin. Those were the exceptions. Um, so. 
the there was the creation of the American shadow, and I would say that the brighter the light, the darker the shadow. America had an incredibly beautiful, inspirational vision to get started, even if it was largely appropriated from Native American societies. But we had this beautiful vision. Um, but we did not live up to that vision at all. I mean, we gave the vote to only white male property owners. And by the way, that was not the case during the colonies, because if you were a property owner, if you were a woman, you could still you could still vote. And if you were a person of color and a property owner, you could still vote under the colonies. And in certain weird exceptions, like in New Jersey, up until 1807 in New Jersey, uh, people of color and women could still vote. But in general, the the founding fathers gave that authority to the states, and the states wrote in some restrictive language that de- that made it de facto that only white male property owners could vote. That's a huge problem. So we pushed into the shadow um, true equality. And yet... We had this beautiful, bright light talking about equality, talking about all men are created equal, talking about equality. So what happened is, over the course of time, America's shadow has become unveiled. It's revealed itself, and change has happened. So, as Theodore Parker said, and Barack Obama liked to quote, um, changing the quote a little bit, but, you know, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. And I think that's very much true. And I also think that Donald Trump, for all his failings, for the corruption and corrosive environment that was created, Donald Trump became a catalyst for the revealing of the American shadow, a profound catalyst for the revealing of the American shadow. And this has a very positive upside. because It it, it harkens back to the true meaning of apocalypse. And for those that were worried about the Trump administration bringing the apocalypse, it may have done so in the original sense of the word only, in that apocalypse is an unveiling it's a revealing so in the trump administration we began to see america as it really is and in fact even after i finished the book original politics um, about a year ago we had the george floyd murder we can call it a murder now since derek chauvin was convicted and and, a, and going to be sentenced based on a murder of George Floyd. And that, that murder was an indication of something very profound shifting in the American psyche. Because as, as I see it, for the first time really, many white Americans began to wake up and realize the extent of the systemic racism that exists in this country. Hey, it was there all along. It's not that Donald Trump increased that. Donald Trump gave license to uh, uh, certain shadow elements of the society to come out in the open. But all that did is that created a awareness, a greater awareness on the part of the public. We see it in the George Floyd case. We actually saw it on day one of the Trump administration with the Women's March and the Women's March leading to the Me Too movement, leading to more women running for office and more women winning office than ever before. And that was a beautiful thing. Um, And we also had women from all walks of life uh, entering the political arena People like Deb Holland became my congresswoman from New Mexico. Uh, Shari Stavids from the Ho Chunk Nation, the two the first, two two uh, Native American congresswomen, the first ever, 
Um, that's great because that's a recapturing of what was true in Native America a long time ago because the women's councils were so important. It was the women's councils who nominated the male chief and had the right to remove him. Um, the women's councils who who uh, needed two-thirds votes of the clan mothers to go to war or to sign treaties. So women had a very integral role in politics on this continent. And now something else is happening. Now there's something even more profound happening here with COVID, with George Floyd. Because when that police officer put his knee on the neck of George Floyd during COVID, it became readily apparent that that was a metaphor for what all of humanity had been doing to Mother Earth. It was Mother Earth that could not breathe. It was Mother Earth that had the, the, the knee upon her neck. We've been literally paving over Mother Earth. We have not been sensitive to the rhythms of the natural world. We have become unaware of how intimately related we are as a part of nature. And this is what gives me the most hope. Because during COVID, I hope that people began to realize how intimately interrelated we are, not just with all of the human beings, but with all aspects of the natural world. We talked about this in earlier podcasts, how we're, our cells are 90% microbial. Our DNA is 95% from the microbial world. It's that microbial world that's pushing evolution. And I believe that what is happening here, what will happen after COVID, is a consciousness sh change, a shift. The world is as, as we dream it, or the world is as you dream it, is the, t is the title of John Perkins' book. And John Perkins will be a, uh, a guest uh, very soon on the Circle for Original Thinking. And indeed, that's true because... It's the as you envision the world, as you as you envision what is real, that is the reality that you create. And if we can start to shift toward realizing that we are interconnected with all there is, and we can start to shift to a blessing, a blessing mentality, and start remembering how beautiful it is to be human on this planet. If we can do that, we can recalibrate our relationship with the natural world and stop extracting for only human good, um, ignoring the voices of all of nature. So much has shifted. You know, since the 1970s, we have laws actually being written, which are now asking for human beings to take responsibility for the natural world. Even a law in New Zealand that recognized a river as a sentient being. Hey, rivers and mountains are what make up life. That's what the ancient Chinese understood. That is what Everyone can realize that they, the mountains have this relationship with, with the valley. The mountains look over the valley. The mountains nurture the valley. The mountains attract the clouds that bring the rains that then, that then uh, create the green growing on the mountains that bring the water to the valleys. Human beings have to realize in a similar way to the valleys that we are nourished by the mountain. We're nourished by all the elements. We don't have to, we don't have to think from a scarcity mentality as much as we seem to have convinced ourselves. It's the scarcity mentality that causes confrontation. It's the scarcity mentality that, that has caused our despoilation of the environment and, and, uh, the 
motivation just to profit above all. It's the scarcity mentality that uh, we need to address if we are going to solve the seemingly intractable problems of politics. So how do we solve the seemingly intractable problems of politics? Put it another way, how do we find hope when everything seems to be falling apart? Well, the truth is sometimes things need to get worse before they get better. Things need to fall apart before something new can be born. It's a principle of entropy. It's, it's what happens in nature. Things disintegrate, then things are created. So right now, you know, let's look at the Republican Party or something. It, it appears to be imploding right before our eyes. But this is not necessarily the permanent state of affairs. In fact, this is not the permanent state of affairs. One thing you can be certain of is things will change. The Republican Party of today may, may be like the, the Whig Party of the 1850s that split into two factions, one for the expansion of slavery into the new territories and one against the expansion of slavery. And that led to the, to the demise of the party. It gave rise to the Republican Party of Lincoln. And as I pointed out in original politics, today's Republican Party could not be further apart than the Republican Party of Lincoln. And the Democratic Party of today could also not be further apart from its beginnings as the conservative pro-slavery party. Parties are dynamic entities. The Democratic Party, while it may look good now, contrasted with the Republican Party, also has undergone a great deal of restructuring and needs to undergo more restructuring now. In fact, both parties have sold out to corporate interests more than people may realize. And and, and some of that is not entirely their fault, since the Supreme Court decision of Citizens United left let in so much dark money into politics. It was not that long ago that there was widespread bipartisan support for positive ecological change. Just go back to the 1970s. And that was during the Nixon administration when the EPA was formed and the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts were passed. There was a great deal of momentum then for positive ecological change. And how did that happen? Well, it followed a renaissance in ecological thinking on the heels of... Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring, there was a resurgence of interest in ecology. There was a a newfound awareness in how everything was radically interconnected, and that was directly related to a resurgence of interest in Native American thinking. You know, that's when the Native American tribal colleges started to pick up steam. And today there's something similar building. I I do feel positive about it. There's a groundswell, mostly coming from the youth, you know, um, against what's happening with climate change. Look at Greta Thunberg, how much she's uh, influenced uh, young people today. That does give me hope. And at the same time, what you might call the righteous anger of the youth movement, is it's not the whole picture either. What needs to happen is a maturing of ecological thinking into a movement that recovers a love of nature, a love of the sacred. Because scare tactics, whether or not they're based in truth, will, you know, scare tactics alone, and I'm not trying to say that, that the youth movement about, about climate change is all scare tactics, but it is trying to awaken people in a, in a, in a way that amounts to a scare tactic because we're, when, you, when you try to alarm people about uh, climate change, whether or not that's justified, unfortunately, people can't process that. They can't, they can't process, they do process alarm in their amygdala, you know, and our amygdala is, is, was set up by nature to, 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 to keep, to keep uh, you know, to just avoid some catastrophe, uh, an, uh, an animal rushing at us. or uh, So it's a, it's a, it gives a short-term burst of adrenaline. It cannot be sustained. 
love is the only thing that can be sustained. Love sustains, sustains the heart. It's a love of nature that's going to return us to, to the right path. And I'm not saying this isn't the apocalypse, but it, it's the apocalypse in the original meaning of the word that's what's happening now. It's an unveiling of what needs to change. And what needs to change most is the shift to recovering and reconnecting with nature, rebuilding a relationship with the natural world, rebuilding a relationship with the land. I made the subtitle of Original Politics, Making America Sacred Again for a Reason. The way to recover the sacred is to realize first and foremost that America was a place before it was an idea for a nation. The original wisdom is held in the land. It was that wisdom that spoke through indigenous peoples, and it was that wisdom through indigenous peoples that inspired our founding fathers for the principles of justice, liberty. But what we need to realize now is that ecological justice and social justice are connected. Everything in nature has a purpose, a place, just as every human being has a purpose, deserves a place, an opportunity to grow and prosper. When MLK said injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere, he was on to something very, very important. Ecological justice and social justice are connected, must be connected. We are blessed to live in a land of beauty, It is the wisdom of the land that again needs to speak through. It's the wisdom of the land of radical interconnection. That's what we need to see. Nature is not about survival of the fittest. You know, even Darwin didn't think that. That was only in the fifth edition of Origin of Species. The the, the nature is based so much more on respect and cooperation, harmony, symbiosis. Like I mentioned before, 90% of our cells are microbial. We are interconnected with all of nature. The respect for the right of everything to exist in nature will lead to a love and respect of each other. This is our pathway forward. This can be done only if we reorient our thinking. Make this our dream and it will become our reality. May it be so. For all our relations, aho mitaku yasen. This program is made possible in part by Select Books, Waterside Publications, Bizgenics, and Web Talk Radio. Native flute music by Orlando Secatero from the Pathways CD. Liberty song by artist Ron Crowder, written by Ron Crowder, Jim Casey, and Danny Casey. Post-production editing by Scout Media Strategies. The Circle for Original Thinking is a grassroots think tank whose mission is to seek out the deep origins of contemporary thought in order to remember and restore heart-centered wisdom for humanity and all our relations on Earth. For more information or to volunteer to help produce this podcast, go to originalthinking.us or originalpolitics.us. And you can also find and purchase my books, Original Thinking and Original Politics there. Thank you for listening, and until next week, many blessings of good health and well-being to you. Bye for now.